Good morning. Welcome to City Reach. My name is Timon. I'm the senior pastor here at City Reach Oakton. So good to see you here today. Uh, yes, yeah, some big prayer we need this week for we're starting various ministries are starting off this week. We've got um, the young adults camp, which is planned for this, uh, uh, this Friday and Saturday. And that we're, we're focusing our young adults this year on reaching out to university students. And so 17 to 24 year olds and and at, at present, we only have 17 registrations for that camp, and we need 40. So let's be praying that we would get those registrations for the camp. Uh, also, on Saturday night, we're starting a new ministry for young marrieds and young workers, 24 plus. So that's kicking off this Saturday night at my house. So be praying for that. This afternoon, we've also got a, um, a Mandarin congregation meeting. And as of yet, we've got three people in the core team. Probably need a few more than that. So if you're interested, three o'clock this afternoon, up in our um, up in in uh, our training room, and uh, just be praying for that uh, that God would raise up the people needed. And I'm I'm trusting God that He will do that because He's a good God. Hey, Amen. Well, uh, if you have your Bibles, open them up to John chapter 13, and we're continuing our series in the Gospel of John called the Servant Revolution. If you're just joining us for the first time. What we do here at City Reach is we teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the Bible, and we've been studying for some time the Gospel of John. This is the fourth Gospel in the New Testament, written by John, an eyewitness of Jesus. And uh, we've entitled this section of our study, The Servant Revolution, because we see Jesus, as he prepares his disciples for his departure, he demonstrates his heart of service. And Jesus didn't come to be served, but he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And he calls us as his followers first to be served by him and be washed clean by him. And then he calls us to be people who serve others. And this morning as we come into John 13, we're gonna be studying verses 31 to 35, that paragraph this morning. As we come to this paragraph, I believe that this paragraph is right at the heart of John's teaching. This is right the passionate core of John, the Apostle John. You know, as you read the New Testament, you, you pick up that various different New Testament authors had different emphasis. For example, if you come along to the Romans course, starting in a few weeks on Monday night, you'll find that the emphasis on Paul is on justification by faith. But John's emphasis is quite different. Now, I'm going to share with you up front my big idea for this message, which is really also, I think, summarizes the emphasis of John's whole ministry. And to be honest, I didn't come up with this big idea. Um, usually when I prepare sermons, I don't like to borrow from anyone else. I just like the Lord to speak to me. But last year, I was at a friend's church, Brad, and... Uh, in uh, the Summit Church in Auckland, and he was preaching on this passage, and his message really spoke to me. And as I was preparing this week, I thought, I just, I'm just gonna share Brad's big idea with you from his message, because it's so good. And I was really thinking, Lord, you know, the reason why I wouldn't share it is because of my pride. <laughs> and so I don't wanna be proud. So let me just share with you the big idea of this passage, as I said, and it's the big idea of John's whole teaching. It's this. And you can write this down on your notes. Love at its best loves us at our worst. Let me say that again. Love at its best loves us at our worst. I would suggest to you that the times when you have experienced love at its best, it's been when you have been at your worst. I remember when I was 18 and I first got my license and a friend of mine called me up and asked me to go to the movies. Now, I knew my dad wouldn't really appreciate me going to the movies with this friend, so I lied to my father, and I said that I was going into Harvey Bay to go and visit my grandmother. Now, I was running a little bit late as I was driving into Harvey Bay, so I was speeding. And I went straight through an intersection and missed a give way sign, and this car just smashed right into the side of my car and completely rode it off. And when I came sort of to, my first instinct was just to put the foot down and just try and get out of there, but there was no way that I was going anywhere because my car was a complete write-off. And this big burly guy, he came over and he knocked on my window. He was the guy who had smashed into me. 
He said, son, I think we need to talk. And then he rang the police. And I was bawling my eyes out. And I wondered, what would my dad say? I rang up my dad to come and get me. And I wondered, what would my dad say? Would, would he be upset because I'd lied to him and I'd ridden the car off? But I'll never forget it. On that trip home with my dad, my dad never once mentioned the fact that I had lied to him. And he never once rubbed it in that I'd ridden off the car. Rather, he loved me. You see, love at its best loves us at our worst. And here we see love at its best. Look down in the story in verse 31. We read, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him. The he there is Judas. Remember the context. It is Thursday night. On Friday in 24 hours, Jesus is going to be lifted up on a cross. And he has just shared the Passover meal with his disciples. He's washed their feet. He's loved his enemy, Judas. And Judas has scurried out into the night to get the chief priests in order to hand Jesus over to the chief priests. And as I said, in less than 24 hours, Jesus will be hanging in agony on the cross. But Jesus didn't see this as a moment of shame. Rather, he saw this as his finest hour. You know, Winston Churchill, in the Second World War, he said that when Britain was up against it in the Second World War against the Nazi war machine, he called it Britain's finest hour. Where here, Jesus sees him going to the cross as being his finest hour. But how did Jesus glorify God on the cross? Well, first, the cross glorifies God in that it reveals the greatness of God. You know, many people thought that this was the greatest defeat, but actually this is the greatness of God. He's able to bring out of defeat the greatest victory. It also reveals the justice of God. You see, the penalty for sin is death. And God being a just God, he couldn't let sin go unpunished. You know, God is a God of love, so when he sees how we have messed up this world and how we sin against one another, it grieves God's heart, and his heart is moved with justice. But thirdly, it reveals, the cross reveals the, the glory is, is for the glory of God because it reveals the amazing love of God. God, the offended party, he puts forward his son to be the one who suffers the judgment that we deserve. Love at its best loves us at our worst. Now look down in your Bibles in verse 32. Jesus continues, he says, if God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Now there's a lot of glories in that verse, isn't there? <laughs> but basically what Jesus is saying is, Jesus is saying, I'm gonna glorify God by going to the cross, but God will honor me. And three days later, Jesus would be raised from the dead, and then he would be exalted to the Father's right hand in heaven. But look down your Bibles in verse 33. Jesus continues, little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Now, on two previous occasions, Jesus had said to the Jews that where he was going, they could not come, and he was referring to heaven. But do you see the love and compassion of Jesus right here? He knows that for his disciples, he's gonna to go to the cross, he's gonna be raised, and they're gonna see him after his resurrection, but then he's gonna to ascend to the Father's right hand, and they're not gonna see him again in their lifetime. And Jesus is preparing them. He's showing tender care, little children. He's showing them love. But then we come to the heart of this whole paragraph, verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Now, as I said, this is the heart of John's teaching. I don't think you can understand the Apostle John apart from this. You know, church tradition says that they would call the Apostle John the Apostle of Love. 
And he would often come out, even as an old man, because John was an apostle that lived to a ripe old age, and he would come out, and he would just raise his hand to the congregation, and he would just preach a very simple sermon. He would just say, beloved, let us love one another. And one of the things that I did this week uh, is I just, in preparing, I just went through First uh, John, the letter of First John, and I just took a highlighter, and I suggest you do this, and I just highlighted all of the times John mentions love. It is astounding when you do that. Let me just give you some of the highlights. 1 John 2.10, whoever loves his brother abides in light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. 1 John 3, 11, for this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. 1 John 3, 16, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. I love that that's the same reference as John 3, 16. 1 John 3, 16, that's great. 1 John 3, 23, and this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son Jesus, really important, and love one another just as he commanded us. 1 John 4, 7 and 8, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. The fruit of being born again is you love other people. Now, it's fascinating that out of all of the gospel authors, only John mentions the new commandment. It's not mentioned by Matthew, it's not mentioned by Luke, it's not mentioned by Mark, it's only mentioned by John. And I think, as I said a few weeks ago, the things that impact us are the things we tend to remember. And when you listen to Bible teachers or ministers, you'll find the things that come through in their sermons are the things that impact them the most. And as you're gonna see in this message, I think that this really impacted John, the events of this night. Well, now let's dig down deep and study a little bit deeper this new commandment because it's so important to Jesus. So let's dig down deep into the new commandment because as many people have observed, like in one sense, you know, God did command the nation of Israel to love. In Leviticus 19, verse 18, the Lord said, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. So the Lord did command his people to love. So in what sense is this new commandment new? How can Jesus say, I am giving you a new commandment? Well, first, the new commandment is new in that it is part of the new covenant. Now, John doesn't record it in his gospel, but earlier that night, Jesus had taken bread, he'd broken it, and he'd said, take, eat. He'd taken a cup, and he had said, take, drink. This is the blood of my new covenant given for you. So Jesus set up communion as this demonstration of this new covenant, this new relationship that he was bringing between God and people. Um, John would say, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Aren't you so glad that you live under the new covenant and not under the old covenant? Under the old covenant, there were 613 commandments that God commanded the nation of Israel to keep. But now under the new covenant, Jesus has one simple commandment. Love one another. Now, there are other commandments in the New Testament. Obviously, there's plenty of commandments in the New Testament, but all of those commandments should be seen as fleshing out what it means to live a life of love. Look at what, what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. He says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. What counts? Faith working its way out in love for other people. The Apostle Paul would say in Ephesians 5, verse 1, he would say, Beloved, be imitators of God and live a life of love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. You know, when we tend to think about holiness, we tend to think in terms of what we do not do. But the, but the New Testament not only says, no, it's not just about what you don't do, it's actually about what you do do. 
Do you live a life of love? Paul would say the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Many commentators would, would suggest that there is one fruit of the Spirit, love, and it has all these different flavors. It expresses itself in joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. But not only, is the new covenant, not only is the new commandment new in that it's part of the new covenant, but it's new in its object. We are to love one another. You know, you notice that Jesus gave this commandment once Judas had left, and now just the disciples are left. The church is left. You know, often churches have um, signs like this now on your way in, which I love this sort of sign, welcome home, a place where you belong. And this is what a church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a family. It's supposed to be a place where you belong, where you're accepted, where you're loved, where you can take off the mask, where you can be yourself. But also, it's not only new and it's part of a new covenant, it's new and it's new object, but it's new and it's standard. You know, often when we think about grace, we think that grace lowers the bar. But this, this of Jesus, he's radically lifting up the bar. We don't just love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. How did Jesus love you? Sacrificially, costly. Love at its best, loves at its worst. But also the new commandment is also that new distinguishing mark. Jesus says, by this all men shall know that you are my disciples if you have loved one for another. And aren't you glad Jesus said that? Aren't you glad that the mark of being a disciple of Jesus is not that you have to know Wayne Grudem's systematic theology off by heart? Or not that you have a certain spiritual gift? Now, Jesus says the evidence that you're my disciple is that you love one another. But I don't know about for you guys, but as I read this, Jesus saying a new commandment I'm giving to you, love one another just as I have loved you, I'm immediately convicted. I mean, do you love like this? Do you love people at their worst? I mean, it's easy to love some of you because you're so attractive. You're easy to love. It's easy to love some people because you know, it's not hard to love them. It doesn't cost much to love them. They're not difficult to love. Some people, it's easy to love them because as you love them, you get something in return. When you love them, they love you back. But what about the ones to whom, when you love them, it's so costly to love them? It costs you something. It costs you energy and time and effort to love them. And don't, you don't really get anything in return. Where does the power come from to love like that? Because let me tell you, the people in the world out there, they can love the attractive people. They can. But Christians should have a power to love and should love in a way that's completely different. Love at its best loves at its worst. Where does the power come to love like that? Well, I'm once again indebted to my brother, Brad Carr, because he made this really powerful observation in the text. So look down your Bibles, and you will notice that the new commandment in verses 31 to 35 is wedged between two exhibits of Jesus loving people at their worst. Exhibit A, Judas, from verses 18 to 30, and Exhibit B, Peter, from verses 36 to 38. So let's look firstly, briefly, at Exhibit A, Judas. Now, I don't want to go deeply into Judas because we looked at Judas last week, but love at its best, love's at its worst. And Jesus loved Judas at his worst. Jesus already knew that Judas was going to betray him, yet Jesus washed his feet. Jesus gave him every opportunity to turn back and repent. Jesus gave him the position of privilege at the feast. Jesus dipped the corset, the, 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 um, the Passover uh, meal, into, into the dip, and he gave it to Judas, symbolizing friendship, symbolizing honor to Judas. 
And even when Judas ran out into the night, this is the power of Jesus' love, none of the other disciples knew what was going on. Jesus loved Judas so completely and thoroughly that they didn't know what was going on. Love at its best loves at its worst. Do you love like that when it comes to your enemies? Do you love them so completely that no one knows that what they've done towards you? I don't know about it for you, but you know, when someone's done something against me, I tend to sideline that person and want to stay away from that person. Love at its best, love's at its worst. But also we see this love exhibited in exhibit B in Peter. Now you have to love Peter. When Peter hears Jesus say, where I am going, you cannot come, Peter responds in verse 36, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. Now, this is not Peter's finest moment. This is Peter being arrogant and proud. In Matthew's gospel, Matthew records that Peter actually said to Jesus, well, all others may fall away because of you, but I'll never fall away, Jesus. And then Jesus answered him, Peter, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. And before the night was out, Peter had denied even knowing Jesus three times. But love at its best loves us at our worst. And Jesus still loved Peter, the arrogant, proud, full of himself, self-sufficient disciple. And he still had a plan for Peter. In fact, in Luke's gospel, we read that Jesus said to Peter, Simon, Simon, Whenever a name is repeated twice, it's a demonstration of love. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus still had a plan for Peter, and he would restore Peter. But did you realize that there is another person in this story who was there that night who was completely transformed by the love of Jesus, and that is Exhibit C, John himself. I mean, John was there at the Last Supper, and he was the only one out of the rest of the disciples who knew in that moment what Judas was doing, for he'd been leaning against the breast of Jesus and had said, Lord, who is it who will betray you? And Jesus had whispered to him, it is he to whom I give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. And it's interesting in verse 23, Look at the way that John refers to himself. He refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now this phrase, this is the first time that John uses this phrase, but he'll go on to use it another five times. You see, love at its best loves us at our worst. And John knew what it was like to experience love even at his worst moments. You see, before the apostle John was called the disciple whom Jesus loved, he had another nickname given to him by Jesus. Do you know what that nickname was? Yeah, it was Boanerges, the Sons of Thunder. An excellent name for an 80s metal band, I think. <laughs> and Jesus had given him that name because on this one occasion when a Samaritan village had rejected them, James and John had come to Jesus and had said, Jesus, do you want us to call down fire from heaven on this village? And Jesus said, you're, you're Boanerges, you're the sons of thunder, you've got a temper. And James and John had also come to Jesus and they'd asked to sit on his right hand and on his left hand. You see, these were fiery, angry boys, pretty pathetic excuses for disciples. But love at its best loves us at our worst. And you see, how do we love like Jesus? How do we love people even when it costs, even at their worst? We'll look back in verse 34 again to those words. You are to love one another just as I have loved you. Now this is talking about the standard of love, but I think it's also talking about the source of love. We love because he first loved us. 
Do you know, I have to be honest. I'm a pretty pathetic excuse for a disciple. I'm like Judas, I betray Jesus. I'm like Peter, I deny Jesus. I'm like John, I lose my temper on occasion. But love at its best loves us at our worst. And there might be some people in this room and you have had the worst week imaginable. You have nothing on your spiritual resume as you come in this morning. You didn't pick up your Bible, you didn't pray, you didn't come to Thursday night prayer meeting, you did nothing. Love at its best loves us at our worst. You are still loved. That is grace. And that is what Christianity is all about. It's not about our performance. It's about his performance on our behalf. And you will never love like Jesus until you've experienced his love, until you're overflowing with his love. You know, my wife, my beautiful wife Tegan was talking to someone recently And this is so hard for our minds to get around grace. It's so offensive to us. It offends our pride. Tegan was talking to someone, and they've been a Christian for a long time, and they they said to her, surely, surely, you know, I know that we're saved by grace, but surely we have to do something. And Jesus said, no. You don't have to do anything. This is the offense of grace. If it is by grace, Paul would say, it is no longer by works, and boasting is excluded. You know, often I preach messages, and, I'm, and I was talking to Pastor Andy at your, at, your, at your engagement pay last night, and I was saying, what I really want from this morning's message is, like, is you guys to just bathe in that truth. Because often I preach these messages, and I'm like, you really love Jesus. <laughs> and I'm like, ask me your questions to convict you. And, um, and, 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 and there's a place for that. But I'm... But I'm just, what I want you to be bathed in today, pastorally, I want you to be bathed in his love. You are loved apart from your performance. You are loved. Yes, you are more sinful than you ever could imagine, but you are more loved than you dare ever believed. You are loved. When I heard Pastor Brad Carr preached this message a year ago. I had had a terrible week. I hadn't pursued the Lord like I should. Old sins had come back into my life. And let me tell you, you feel guilty. You feel guilty? You try being a pastor (laughs) and having a week like that. You feel really guilty. And just to hear the words of the gospel again, you are loved. It's just so refreshing. You see, let me give you the application for this message this morning. It's this, is you need to embrace your identity as the disciple whom Jesus loves so that you can become disciples who love like Jesus. It is people who are radically bathed in his love and transformed by his grace who then go out and they love others in the way that they have been loved. And so what you need to do is you need to embrace your identity as the disciple whom Jesus loves. So when you meet people and they say, what's your name? You say, I am the disciple whom Jesus loved. Let's try that again. When you meet people, you say, or when you go to like conferences and they have little name badges and they have, hello, my name is, you know what you should write on there, Pete? I am the disciple whom Jesus loves. Because before you become the disciple who loves like Jesus, you need to embrace your identity as the disciple whom Jesus loves. And I know this sounds offensive to many of you. Many of you are going, oh, I don't know whether I can agree with this. If you you put people under that, under grace, then they won't behave. But when you are gripped by the love of God, when you know that you are loved at your worst, then you will give all to him. You will sacrifice all. You'll lay down your life as a living sacrifice. You'll pursue him. You'll read your Bible. You'll pursue community. You'll you'll go after him because you love him. You love him. Not because you have to, but because you now love Jesus. 
You love him. So embrace the fact that I'm looking at a whole heap of disciples whom Jesus loved. <laughs> embrace the fact that you're a disciple whom Jesus loved so that you can become disciples who love like Jesus. Because love at its best loves us at our worst. And this is the amazing love of Jesus for us. Let's just pray, eh? Lord, we just come to you today. And we want to be a church that has this dynamic of the new commandment in it, where we love one another. We don't just love like the world loves. We don't just love each other because, you know, there's something we can get out of each other if we give love to one another. But we love even expecting nothing in return. We love like Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that you would just bathe every heart this morning in this amazing, transforming love of Jesus. That every person here who is a follower of Jesus, who has turned to Jesus in weakness and come and repented of sin and come and laid themselves bare before, have been cleansed by him and they can approach the throne of grace anytime they need to get grace and mercy in their time of need. And I, I just pray, Lord, that you would pour out your love on us, that the love of God would be shed abroad in our hearts today. We would know that love of God that is beyond knowledge that Paul prays about in Ephesians 3, that Christ might dwell in our hearts through faith, and we might know the breadth and the depth and the height, and to know the love of God that's beyond knowledge. Lord, I pray that you'd pour out your love upon us, Lord, so that we would be transformed by this amazing love of Jesus. And then we would show love to one another, even though it costs, even though it's difficult.